it was lunch time, and my father was praying for the lunch that we were about to eat. But there was only one problem. Our table was empty. My earliest recollections is finding myself at the age of five, roaming the streets, eating from dumpsters. We were not able to have food at all, at all. We were forced to live with 17 of our other relatives in a very small shanty. No toilets. A lot of crime. No running water. There's a lot of rape for children. If you want to be out of poverty, then you have to deal with drugs. Some of my friends were actually sold into prostitution. And as darkness engulfs the place, the devil takes over. One morning, I just woke up that, you know, my uncle is just touching me in some parts of my body that I just thought to myself that this can't be happening. My father was murdered right next to my mother. And I knew that moment that my life had changed. I watched as my 10-month-old sister died in the laps of my mother out of starvation. My relatives always tell me, Michelle, you are so ugly. You look exactly like your father. You will become nothing but a thief and a drug addict when you grow up. And those were the words that I heard from people whom I expected to love and take care of me. Poverty had told me I am hopeless, I am nothing, and I believed that. But right in the middle of this desperation, it was then that compassion intervened. One Sunday morning, my Aunt Carol, she registered me in that compassion project. What joy and dancing came to my home at the news that I'd finally got a sponsor. I received my first letter. We wrote back and forth. And they told me, you are my first friend outside my continent. She said words like, Richmond, I love you and that lightened me up. When my sponsor told me that, Michelle, you are beautiful, you are precious to us, we are proud of you, and we are praying for you, and we love you. And the words touched the very depth of my heart and soul. Eighteen years later, here I am, a child, rescued from hopelessness. She was 15 years old. Her name is Ashley. Her name was Heather. I called her mom. One act saved my life. Saved my life. Will you act? A choice is yours. Sponsor a child through compassion today. Release a child from poverty. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. This morning is the one Sunday a year when we celebrate Compassion Sunday. It's the one Sunday a year when we celebrate the ministry that is spirit-inspired and effective around the world that is being supported and accomplished through Compassion International. And it's also the one Sunday that we give you, as members and friends of this church, the opportunity to, if you feel led by the Spirit, to leave this place, but not leave empty-handed, but leave with the sponsorship of a child around the world in order to release them from poverty in Jesus' name. In the few moments that I have with you this morning, I wanna spend some time talking to you about the idea of vision. Because a vision can be a powerful, life-giving force in the world, and organizations like Compassion are often started by one individual who has an experience that changes their life forever. And that experience leads them to inquire of the Lord, Lord, what would you have me do? And God gives them a vision that will in turn give life to people around the world. So I want to talk to you about vision. The scriptures say in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, in the old King James Version, where there is no vision, the people perish. Perish. 
Now, frankly, that might not be the best translation of that passage, but yet there's something about that translation that we need to hear and understand, namely that a vision can be a powerful, life-giving force, and without it, places around the world suffer from death and poverty and destruction. So a vision can be a powerful, life-giving force. The Greek philosopher Aristotle once said that the soul never thinks without a picture. The soul never thinks without a picture. In other words, in that part of us that God has created and designed to be inspired by his spirit, God will often give it to us a picture of how the world ought to look, what it should look like. But as Christians, we know this that often the reality of the world is that what exists today does not look like what God would have it look like. In other words, many of us spend a lot of our time in the tension of what we know the world should be, but the reality that it's not quite there yet. And often in this place, in the sort of realization that there's something just not right about the world, that God plants the seeds of a vision in our lives. But in the tension between what is and what God longs for there to be, there is often this sense of frustration, angst, or maybe even heartbreak. And if we'll pause just long enough in the tension between what is and what God longs for there to be, God will inspire a vision within our souls of how perhaps God is inviting us to be a part of the solution. There is this tension And sometimes the tension can be heard palpably in the grumbling bellies of a child sitting around a lunch table where his father is saying a prayer over the meal, only there is no meal to be had. This tension can be felt in the reality that there's systemic injustice around the world that leads to grinding poverty in places in the world. And we know that God does not long for this to be this way. Consider this, Compassion International cites that today in the world there are roughly 400 million children living in extreme poverty. That's one in five. 400 million children living in extreme poverty and Compassion defines this as living on less than a dollar 90 per day or living in circumstances where there's no access to food, clean drinking water, sanitation, access to education or healthcare. In these circumstances, 400 million children live every single day of their lives. There's a gap between what exists in the world and what God longs for in the world, and we stand in that gap, and sometimes it breaks our hearts. But simply realizing that a gap exists between what is and what God longs for there to be actually isn't enough. I remember growing up in the early 90s and there was a commercial on television with Sally Struthers. Do you remember these commercials? And Sally would be standing in some unsanitary slums, probably surrounded by a group of children who are skinny with distended bellies, and she's pleading with the viewer to help. I remember this commercial because one time I was watching television with a friend And as this program came on, I remember him looking at me about five seconds into the commercial and saying, I can't bear to watch this anymore. And he turned it off. So simply being aware that there's a gap between what is and what God longs for there to be isn't enough to have a vision. What it requires of us is to stand in the tension, that frustration and heartbreak for just long enough to inquire the Lord, Lord, what might you have me do? One of the reasons I love Compassion International is because they seek to tell the truth about poverty in the world. They seek to communicate that reality, but they do so in a manner in which brings dignity and hope. They help us to see the truth, but to see it in love with the hope that God actually has for the world. In other words, what it means for us is that we can pause this morning and slow down just long enough to stand in the tension between what is and what God longs for there to be and ask the question, Lord, what would you have me do? So I invite you to inquire of the Lord if he'll give to you a picture in your soul for how you might respond to the needs in the world. Anytime we're talking about this kind of vision that God gives to us, it's by its very nature subject to God's overarching vision for the world. And when I want to remember what that overarching vision for the world is, I turn to the New Testament book 
of Ephesians chapter 2, which candidly starts with that tension, the gap between what is and what God longs for there to be, and then we see the great hope of the gospel emerge. This is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. There's the tension, the gap between what is and what God longs for there to be in the world. But then Paul gives us a contrasting word. He says, however, he says, but God is so rich in mercy and he loves us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future generations as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united in Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us new in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I love that last line, don't you? For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. These words just paint a picture that is so beautiful and compelling about the hope that we have in Christ that it stirs the imagination of our soul. You are God's masterpiece. And he's using you in remarkable ways in the world. But let's be honest, there are a lot of people today who would rather focus just on those few words and ignore kind of the first half of the passage, because we don't like standing in the gap between what is and what God longs for there to be. That tension makes us feel uncomfortable. We'd rather minimize it. But the truth of the gospel breaks in at just that point. The truth of the world is this. Today, the world looks a little bit more like Jackson Pollock than Claude Monet. Do you know what I mean? If God's creating a masterpiece in the world, today it looks a little bit more like sin has been splattered and smeared all over God's creation. And so today looks a little bit more like number five than water lilies. But here's the good news. While we would rather turn off or turn away from this tension that exists in the world between what is and what God longs for there to be, the good news of Jesus Christ is that when God saw this gap, he didn't choose to turn away, but rather sent his only son, Jesus. Jesus is the vision that God always had for the world, and Jesus is the one who brings that tension together. It is Jesus who lived the life that we couldn't live and died the death that we should have died in order to close and bridge the gap between our sin that we might be restored and reconciled in God. And the scriptures tell us that now, those of us who are in Christ have become God's masterpiece. At the end of all time, he's going to look back and point to you guys and say, look, see the riches of my grace and mercy, you who have been painted with the palette of grace. God is working in you. You are God's masterpiece. But then Paul goes on to say something else that is even more surprising. He says, you are God's masterpiece created with good works that he's prepared for you in advance to do. Do you see what Paul's saying? Not only are you God's masterpiece painted with the palette of grace, he's inviting you to pick up a brush and join in this ministry of reconciliation that God is bringing about in the world. If we could pause long enough and inquire of the Lord, Lord, what would you have me do? 
I wonder what sort of image he would place in your soul for how you can join in. He was a pastor in Chicago, Illinois, at Central Avenue Baptist Church. And then God called him to do something outside of the box. Having never traveled outside the United States, even once in his life, God called Reverend Everett Swanson to pick up and leave in 1952 and go to Korea to proclaim the gospel to the U.S. troops serving in the Korean War. He picked up everything, left, and just did exactly what the Lord asked of him. And there, in war-torn Korea, he saw things that would make us want to turn away. One morning, as he was walking down the street, he saw some city workers collecting piles of dirty rags and throwing them in the back of a garbage truck. As he got a little bit closer, he realized that those weren't actually dirty rags at all. What he observed was that they were the bodies of orphans who'd frozen or starved in the streets the night before. Talk about an image that is seared into somebody's soul. And from that, he began to inquire of the Lord, what would you have me do? He took the little food that he had with him, and he went to try to offer it to one of the orphans that he found on the street, but it was too late. Now, at this point, many of us would want to turn away, but he paused just long enough and inquired of the Lord, and in the stillness and in the silence of that place, in the midst of the tension and the heartbreak and frustration, he heard the words of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from Matthew chapter 15, which say, I have compassion on the multitude. I will not send them away hungry. Reverend Everett Swanson packed up everything he had, went back to Korea, and with a, or went back to the United States, and with a simple pitch, he was able to convince those in the United States to support the ministry that he saw God inviting him to create in Korea. He gave the simple pitch for $8 a month, he said, you can feed, clothe, and shelter a child in Korea. He went to Korea later that year and built an orphanage. Three years later, he'd built five orphanages. Five years later, he and the network of Christians around the Chicagoland area had built eight orphanages. After eight years, they had built 21 orphanages. Eventually, it was 170 orphanages that they built that were serving 100,000 meals a day to 22,000 children living in Korea. This was the beginning. This was the beginning of Compassion International. He was asked about this at one point, and Reverend Everett Swanson said these words. He said, I began caring for one child. Then it became an orphanage. This one orphanage turned into Compassion Korea and eventually became Compassion World. Today, it's called Compassion International. In 67 years, after God planted this seed of a picture in his heart, Compassion International is doing unbelievable work around the world. I told you earlier that there's 400 million children living in extreme poverty. Today, Compassion International has 1.9 million children sponsored. By 2020, their goal is to break the 2 million mark in terms of child sponsorship. This ministry is being blessed by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and it is releasing children from poverty in remarkable ways. My wife and I, Lauren, she she and I became sponsors when we were living in northern Illinois for the first time. Uh, We heard somebody come to the church and make a pitch for compassion. We went home, got on the computer, and started looking at pictures of children who could possibly use our help. And we found a little boy whose name was Abraham, and he lived in Indonesia. And we said, Lord, I think you're inviting us to be a part of this. And so we sponsored Abraham. We started writing letters to Abraham and sending our uh, $38 a month to him in hopes that it would provide the nutrition needs that he has, the water needs, the uh, sanitation, health care, and education, and a connection to the local church. But after just a few short months, we got a letter in the mail that said uh, Abraham's father had been given a job outside of that small little region in Indonesia where Compassion was serving. So we lost touch with Abraham. So they sent us another name, and we said, okay, we'll sponsor this other child. A few short months later, 
his family, moved outside the area in which Compassion was serving. So after just about a year of sponsoring a Compassion child, my wife said, what do you want to do? I'm sad to tell you that I said, I said, well, maybe the Lord just isn't in this. And perhaps this just isn't the right time. So we suspended being sponsors. I don't know where you are today. I know there's a lot of people in this church that sponsor compassion children. I know there's a lot of people in this church who they write the $38 check a month, but then they have their child or their grandchild be the one who corresponds with the child around the world. But I think there's probably another group of people here this morning. And it's this group that I wanna to talk to especially today because I think there are people probably like me who were compassion sponsors for a while. And then something happened, perhaps even your heart got broken, but you lost touch with that child and you suspended your sponsorship. What I've come to learn is this, that poverty around the world is a complex issue because those who don't have means are often leading lives that are dictated by those who do have means. And so they lose a sense of power and voice. For example, in India, a couple of years ago, actually it was two years ago this weekend, Compassion International was forced to suspend operation in India. It was previously the area where they gave the most resourcing, but what happened was this, that starting in about 2011, the uh, Indian government was being taken over by a sort of Hindu nationalist regime, which was making it really tough for NGOs and nonprofit organizations to come in, and if they disagreed philosophically, they weren't allowed to do their ministry. And so after months and months of trying to work with the Hindu nationalist regime, compassion was forcibly kicked out of India. Here's what that meant practically for a lot of people. There were 147,000 babies, children, and young women who were left, were forced out of the compassion program. And sponsors like you and me who were sitting around had their hearts broken because they had been sponsoring for like 15 years an individual and all of a sudden they lost contact with them. I don't know what your story is, but what I've come to learn is this, that those who live in poverty often have little voice or power to affect their lives and so a government, an organization, or just the economy and where the jobs are dictate where they end up living and so there may be a chance that you've tried to respond and stand in the gap for a child and you've had your heart broken and if you have, let me remind you where we started this morning. There's a tension between what is and what God longs for in the world. And if you're standing in that tension, it is uncomfortable and perhaps even it will break your heart. But that might just be the place where God calls you to do something different. When my wife and I moved to Southwest Florida, we sat through our first Compassion Sunday here at this church. And God stirred the hope in our imagination for what God could do throughout the world. And we began to sense that perhaps God was calling us once again to be sponsors of Compassion Children. So a couple years ago, we started sponsoring a little girl by the name of Jessica. And Jessica lives in the Dominican Republic, which is where our church pours a lot of our energy and resources. And because of its proximity to Southwest Florida and because we can send folks there to actually see the work on the ground. So we started sponsoring Jessica. We were so excited. You know, you know how the refrigerator in your home is sort of like a sacred space when you have kids? When they come home from school and they've created some sort of masterpiece in their classroom, the first thing you do is magnet it up in the refrigerator. When their brand new school pictures come home, the first thing you do is you put a magnet of their picture up on the refrigerator. We became sponsors of Jessica and the first thing we did was we took her picture home and we put it up on the refrigerator. A few months later, a couple of, from our church actually went to visit our compassion child in the Dominican Republic, and uh, they came back with pictures of them with her. So now we have that picture up there as well. Jessica has become such a part of our family system that every single night before bed, as I'm on my daughter duty and I'm saying prayers with them, I'll ask them to say a prayer, and every night they say these words or something to their effect. They'll say, Lord, thank you so much. Lord, thank you that you love Jessica so much. And because you love her, we love her. We pray, Lord, that you would let her know just how much you love her through our love. 
out of their sweet little voices, these words emerge. The following year, uh, my daughter Lucy was uh, about seven years old. She was starting to be able to write pretty well. And we decided that it was a great idea for us to take on another sponsorship. And so since Lucy's broke, we, we footed the $38 a month. And uh, she, she gets to write the correspondence. So we have another uh, compassion child named Leandri. And I want to just read to you one letter that Leandri shared with my daughter Lucy. She said these words, Dear Lucy, may God bless you. Leandri says hello. She's going to school and her best friend's name is Raina. She thanks you for the gift you sent her. She feels so happy because you are always thinking of her. A compassion child is not just a, a photo on a fridge. And it's not just a $38 a month commitment to a place around the world. It is a connection with a real child who needs the love and support that we find in Jesus Christ. You are God's masterpiece. He's painted you with the palette of grace. He's inviting you to pick up a brush. I just want to share one closing thought about this vision that God gives to us. The 16th century saw some of the greatest artistic masterpieces ever created in the world. And some of them were done by the hands of Michelangelo, one of the, one of the greats. The Sistine Chapel, uh, the ceiling there, the last judgment that he painted, but he was not only talented with a brush, he was also talented with a chisel. And one of the greatest pieces that came out of the 16th century was the statue of David that Michelangelo sculpted. And there's a couple really fascinating things, I think, about this sculpture. Now, other people in around the same era also did sculptures of the same scene in the biblical story of David in fighting Goliath. But like Donatello, when he did his sculpture of David, he depicted David as a young boy and following the battle with Goliath, actually with his foot on the head of Goliath. Michelangelo, in contrast, depicts David as a young man and also depicts David prior to the battle. So you see him with a sling over his shoulder. In his right hand, he's got a rock, and he's got a furrowed brow, and his hips are sort of swinging as though he's about to go into battle. Now, here's what I think is fascinating about this. How many of you have seen Michelangelo's David in person? I was shocked last service when I saw the number of hands that went up. It's huge. For those of you who have not seen it, it's like 17 feet tall. You can see how big it is in comparison to the person who's working next to it up there. It is absolutely massive. And at this point in the story, when David is about to battle a giant, what I think is fascinating, and I wonder if Michelangelo may be communicating, who is the real giant in the story? Now, some art scholars would say, well, it's because, you know, Michelangelo sculpted him to be put on top of a the, the top of a cathedral, and so it needed to be big so people could see it, but I wonder if he was communicating something else. Namely, that the giants in our lives aren't so big as in comparison to the power of our great God. Sometimes the problems of the world, the 400 million children who live in extreme poverty, the problems of the world seem like giants to us. But I wonder if Michelangelo's David would teach us that the problems that we think are so big in the world, if we will just listen and inquire of the Lord, what would you have me do, that we can chisel away piece by piece at the problems of the world and bring about God's masterpiece. And one final thing about the statue of David. This statue was sculpted from one solid block of marble. A solid block of marble that no less than two other artists actually looked at and passed on it. And Michael, Michelangelo, by contrast, was able to look at this block of marble and realize that embedded within it was a beautiful masterpiece that just needed to be freed. In fact, he was once asked about it and he said, the sculpture is already complete within the marble before I start my work. It's already there, I just need to chisel away all the superfluous material. Which makes me wonder if we as Christians, those who have been painted in the palette of grace, those of us who have been invited to pick up the brushes and paint right along with our Heavenly Father, if we ought to be the people that can see glimpses of the masterpiece that God is inviting us to be a part of before the rest of the world. 
And what if, in seeing glimpses of it, and seeing the hope that Jesus is bringing about in the world, we were to ask of the Lord, okay, Lord, how might I be a part of it? You are God's masterpiece, painted in the palette of grace, and God is inviting you to pick up your brush and join in this work of reconciliation. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that when you saw the tension between what is and the vision you have for the world that you sent your son Jesus to bridge the gap, we ask, Lord, that as you have saved us, that you might call us to have a picture in our souls of the work that you're inviting us to participate in that you are doing in this world. Thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus. May we respond by giving our very lives to you in Christ's name. Amen.